Quebec has become the first jurisdiction in the world to ban oil and gas exploration and development. Meanwhile, the Trudeau government has approved a massive oil project in eastern Canada, while at the same time they continue to block energy projects in western Canada. What is with this blatant anti-western Canada bias? I'm Candace Malcolm, and this is The Candace Malcolm Show. Everyone, thank you so much for tuning in today. So today I want to have a broader discussion on the oil and gas industry, the energy industry in Canada. And to do so, I am joined by my friend, Michael Binion. Binion is a seasoned entrepreneur with a history of starting, financing, and managing companies primarily in the oil and gas sector. He's a president and founding shareholder of Questair Energy, a public oil and gas company that has production operating in Quebec. He's also the executive director of the Modern Miracle Network, whose mission is to encourage Canadians to have a reason conversation about energy issues, and uh, that is sorely needed in this country. So, Michael, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, it's great to see, be here, and it's great to see you again, Candice. So in mid-April, the uh, Quebec government announced that uh, citizens, this is a story from CTV, citizens officially win a fight to ban oil and gas development in Quebec, Quebec to become the first jurisdiction in the world to explicitly ban oil and gas development in its territory after decades of campaigning by environmental organizations and citizen groups. The newly adopted law will end petroleum exploration and production, as well as public financing of those activities in Quebec. So this is pretty drastic, Michael. What does this mean for our country? What does it mean uh, for you and your operations with Quest Air? And what can we take uh, from this new law that's been imposed? Yeah, well, I mean, there's a lot to unpack in that in that question. So, you know, first, first of all, I think that, you know, we should we should be concerned as Ukraine makes us consider reconsider Canada's role in the world. And, and, I, and, I'm, and I don't think that's true for all for people like yourself and others. I don't think any I don't think any of us didn't think that we, we shouldn't have been reconsidering far before now. But it's certainly, I think, making people in the federal government reconsider our role in the world. I think it's making a lot of Canadians think maybe our role in the world should change. And so as as most of us start to realize that we really need to be thinking about being a place the world can count on as a supplier of last resort, in effect, for resources when 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 um, when rogue states or or kleptocratic states uh, are letting us down, the, the world knows they can count on Canada, right? And and it's discouraging for me that even with that context, that Beck decided to continue on and go the opposite direction. And really, basically, tell Germany and Europe that you know your the, your solution for having built too many windmills is you should build more windmills, and we're not going to do anything to help you. So I find that just discouraging as a Canadian that Quebec moved that way. Um, you know, I I I I also think that that it's um, it's a it's it's discouraging as well from the point of view of that it it went against a big move that's happening in the oil and gas industry right now on technology. And I think contrary or very unexpectedly, oil and gas is, is racing to, to low and zero emissions and has a really good chance. And, and, I'm, and I'm, I've called it that we will in fact get to zero or near zero or net zero, whatever you want to call it. We'll get there before wind and solar. And so it's also discouraging that as Canada is emerging as this technological leader in low emissions oil and gas energy, like potentially lower emissions than wind and solar even, that we have a, we have a province that says, we're, not only are we going to ban you from doing your zero emissions project, we won't even let you pilot it to prove if it works. It's, it's really unbelievable. I mean, when you think about the significant uh, reserves that exist in Quebec, somewhere between 250 billion and uh, 1,000 uh, billion, I guess a trillion cubic meters, uh, according to the Financial Post, I mean, they're sitting on what could potentially uh, be a huge boon to our economy, to their own resource economy. You're talking about uh, allowing people who live up north more economic opportunities, more First Nations jobs. And 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 to your point, I mean, you wrote that uh, the Quebec bill will do nothing to lower emissions. It, it, it's hard to wrap your head around why uh, people in Quebec are so stubbornly opposed to uh, petroleum or car car carbon, uh, you know, 
products. Uh, I mean, you, you spend a lot of time in Quebec. I know you, you, you speak French and you, you talk to a lot of people in Quebec. I know the sentiment exists across the whole country, uh, particularly on the political left, that they just don't want and they don't want oil, period. Um, it, how can we how can we move beyond that conversation and, and start talking more about some of the things you, you just mentioned? And maybe you can elaborate a little bit on the new technologies that are allowing uh, oil and gas exploration development to get closer to carbon uh, zero. Yeah, well, first of all, I should start that, you know, the quote that you made from that CTD article, I felt was, or, or I think it was, a, it was, a, I'm not sure if it was CTD or RDI, but they talking about it, that citizens had won this thing. That's just pure propaganda, right? Like, I don't have an issue with the people of Quebec. The people of Quebec are 75% in favor of my project. Less, less than 15% of Quebecers are against it with, you know, another 10 to 15 undecided. So this is not, this is an issue of, political elites, and and I would say also entrenched interests who don't want competition from lower emissions, cheaper energy, that this is entrenched interests in political elites that are, that are, that are, you know, virtue signaling that we're, you know, we're the first place in the world to ban oil and gas um, over and, and, but over, over against their own people, right? So I think that's one thing I want to say that I don't think that the people of Quebec are have have some cultural difference that they don't also like jobs, they don't also like to do better, that they don't also want to help Ukraine and Germany, for example, right? So uh, I think that's one thing I would just say that, and that polling has been repeated over and over and over, like for years, and also in the last year as the government was contemplating this ban, Main Street did a poll, Leger's done two polls, um, I think Agnes, Angus Reid did a poll. I'm pretty sure it was Angus Reid. It was different pollsters over a period of time have consistently shown that a majority of Quebecers are in favor of developing their own resources and their own natural gas. So, um, I'll, anyways, that's that's a key point. The um, the other thing, just as you said about the size of it, just to confirm that, like the Quebec. Uh, the, the Quebec discovery, the natural gas discovery that we have there, we could replace 50% of Russian exports to Germany. We could, it, it could be 10% of North American LNG exports. It, it, it is, it would make Quebec self-sufficient in gas. It's a massive game changer type of, uh, and, and, and of course, because it's so big, it, it does have disruptive elements. That's why I say, I think there are, there certainly are, you know, people in, entrenched interests in Quebec that are, you know, not, not everybody will be uh, affected positively. So that gets to sort of some of your thinking of like, why are Quebecers against us? I, I, I don't think that the average person on the street, the average person on the street is. Um, I don't know, can I, I just, maybe I'll just go, because I think that, that, that your real question was about the technology, right? So if I can just head into that. Yeah, let's, let's talk about the tech and what, what okay. makes it so, so clean and, and what's changed. Yeah, so I started looking at this a while ago, and, and partly it's because in Quebec, we, you know, we, our, our, we got a ban or a, it was a temporary moratorium on fracking. And, you know, it was to do with, it was basically to do environmental studies. So we went through 134 independent studies. It was as, a, as, a, as an overall comprehensive study. It took three years in Quebec. Mostly came and said that industry was telling the truth all along. And I was, I was really encouraged to hear um, that independent, Francophone PhDs, professors, researchers, basically were true scientists. They just went and got the data and they wrote the reports and told the truth. And of course, these are the types of studies that tend not to get reported in the news. And these are the types of professors and researchers who don't tend to want to be in the news. They don't have an agenda. They're just interested in science, right? So those studies exist. They've been there for a few years. Um, and and But what we did understand was that, you know, maybe due to misinformation or not misinformation, but that there was a demand in the population to say, we want to see lower impacts. We are worried because we've been told to work. We're worried about emissions. And, and, and you know what, quite frankly, so am I. So that's not, we're worried about noise. I get that. We're worried about our water being contaminated. We're worried. Um, we're, so, so I said, well, okay, that's fair. What, what if we could bring those all to zero? Like, is it, so it was a, sort of this idea instead of this is the way we do it now. This is business as usual. How do I improve on what we do now? I said, let's start at this aspirational, theoretical, impossible to achieve goal, develop a project with zero impacts. Well, the interesting thing about that is that it caused me to just really relook at the way we do things in our industry. And in doing that, we did come up with, let's produce all the gas, but let's use the local hydroelectricity. That cut 80% of our emissions. 
And then we said, well, what about if we just install modern SCADA, modern, you know, AI is uh, having an impact on, on, on us being able to stop methane leaks and things like that. Uh, modern, modern, better machined valves, all this, you know, that, that cuts another 15% out. And then the last 5% of our emissions are, you know, mostly what people could refer to as fugitive emissions and so on and so forth. So we can get almost all of those with vapor, ca vapor capture uh, systems, right? So that, so that was the first thing we did. And, and then that was three years ago. And we proposed that. And the environmentalists immediately said to us, like immediately, oh, no, no, production's not the problem. It's the consumption of your product that's the problem. And I said, well, thanks for letting me know that. Because for the last 10 years, you've been telling me that I was the problem, right? The minute I go to zero emissions, you tell me I was never the problem. So, uh, OK, thanks for that. So for the last three years, I've been looking at the consumption. How do we make consumption of natural gas zero emissions? Which, of course, Terry says, well, that's impossible, right? Well, I, I thought producing it with zero was impossible, but it wasn't. And we, we did things differently. The, the consumption side, what, what we've now discovered through different technologies, and I was in high tech before I was in oil and gas, so it's an area of interest for me. Um, there are now, I've now come up, found dozens of technologies, dozens, where you can take CO2, capture it from a flu stack or an industrial process or from you know, a power plant or wherever. And you can take that CO2 and, and convert it using just organic chemistry, all well understood organic chemistry, by the way. Nobody's, just, you know, nobody's inventing a cure for cancer here, right? It's uh, just organic chemistry. You can take that CO2, com combine it with you know, H2O and, and other compounds. There's dozens and dozens of products you can make out of that. And a lot of them are expensive. You know, like I think some of them will be like, you know, you'd need $500 a ton for the CO2 to make it pay. But there are cement additives that you can make from CO2. So this is like basically in a, in a plant, right? Put this, bring the CO2 into a plant. Out, out, of, out of the plant comes cement additives. And those technologies are borderline economic with a zero price on carbon. Um, there's, there's others that I think with, uh, lower prices, you know, they would, they would need some sort of, uh, price to be, um, economic and, um, but, the, but that it got me excited, right? I said, if, if there's going to be a hundred dollar price or, and Trudeau's now talking about 200, $250 total price on carbon. So many of these technologies are, are economic. And, and then the idea of capturing it and just storing it underground is economic. So I looked at it and said, well, if we do what we did, like the, all the, let's think about the three R's, right? If we apply all the things I was talking to about efficiencies that could make our production zero emission, that's called the, the reduce, the reduce element. That's just new technologies and efficiencies. Uh, the re, uh, recycle or reuse. So take that, capture that CO2, recycle it, reuse it, turn it into a feedstock for uh, products, industrial products, consumer products. And then three, return it are returned, the third R being return it under the ground. So our project in Quebec, for example, was an industrial hub. So we were eight, 10 kilometers from industrial hub. What we had to do was to put an extra CO2 line into the pipeline. So we put the gas line, a water line, and now we're gonna also put a CO2 line. We, we needed to do some extra compression um, to be able to move that CO2 and to store it underground. And we, we were gonna sell the gas that we produce with near zero emissions to the industrial hub, industrial users there, um, have them capture and return us the CO2 through that CO2 return line, and then have some of that CO2 that's captured used right there in that industrial park to make things like cement additives. And so we were going to create, which to my knowledge, if we had done it, um, would have been the world's first zero emissions production and, and consumption of natural gas. We gave all that materials to the government and, and they have, you know, they elected instead to go with the, we want to be the first in the world to ban oil and gas. But I'm like, well, why would you ban it if it's zero emissions? Like it's, it would be lower impact than wind and solar. Why would you ban it? Well, I mean, you, you kind of answered the question there with the move, moving goalposts, right? You, you, you found a way to uh, extract it as zero emissions and then they changed the, they changed the, the plans and no, no, now you have to do it, uh, consumption. So. Uh, that that's part of the problem, I suppose, with working with uh, environmental activists is that they don't actually want to find a solution. They just want their way, it seems. I, my, my, I, just, I have a question because 
from my understanding of Canadian federalism, uh, natural resources are, are federal jurisdiction, not provincial. And I, I, I wanted to ask you about how, how legally they can, they can do something like this, uh, wh whether a, a conservative government could do anything, if, if a conservative government were elected federally, if they could do anything to override this. Oh, yeah, right, because uh, sorry, you said federal, but you meant it's provincial, right? The resources are provincial resources is what you meant to say, right? Provincial. So, yeah. So, yeah. So, I mean, what can the federal government do there? Well, I, I think I think the only thing the federal government can really do is to is, is is to do what they do in other areas like health is to encourage um, encourage co uh, cooperation with a national health strategy or a national health policy. They can encourage that through their through funding. Right. And I think they could also encourage um cooperation with a national energy policy if, in, in a similar way. But, but at the end of the day, uh, health is run by the provinces. And at the end of the day, resources are run by the provinces. So, you know, they obviously have the final decision, but there, but the federal government certainly has strong um, core, uh, uh, powers of uh, persuasion to uh, help have people say, well, it, manage and run your own resources how you want, but please try to cooperate with this national policy of that Canada's role in the world is to is to be the provider of last resort to be that one place in the world the world that, that people can count on in when there's an emergency like there is or a crisis like there is today well i i, I wanted to ask you about the equalization formula because western provinces as you know distribute billions of dollars towards quebec every year fairness alberta uh, estimates that quebec receives approximately 13 billion uh, per year um, you, you know, evidently the provinces that contribute to the equalization fund or that, that give more to the federal government than they get back are all energy producing, oil and gas producing provinces, whereas we talked about Quebec sits on a reserve uh, that isn't. So I'm wondering uh, what, what your thoughts are on incorporating um, untapped energy reserves into the equalization formula. Yeah, that's that's always been a thing. I mean, Pauline Merois, when she was premier, um, said explicitly, why would we develop our uh, resources? It just reduces our equalization. Um, and what, 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 the way she put it, of course, because she was actually pro oil, actually, but the way she put it, well, we should separate first and then we should develop it so that we don't end up we don't end up having our oil and gas. Um, go back to the rest of the country. So in the formula, you know, it's a point you've made, I've written papers on this, or I guess op-eds to be more fair, um, that the 50% of the resource revenue in effect would be clawed back through the equalization formula. So Quebec would only keep 50% of the resource revenues. Um, you know, when the Legault government was uh, running or elected their, their, their uh, one of their campaign platforms was uh, points was to, get Quebec off equalization. Um, you know, I, th I think those are popular things to say and think, but pragmatically, I th you know, I think we've, we've seen the equalization just continues to go up for Quebec. And of course, developing these resources for sure would make the, the you know, even in full development, I think we looked at it, with, it, it, may, it might get it would get Quebec off a material amount of equalization, not all of it, but it would be very material. But in effect, you know, not all that money goes to Quebec. Some of that money would come to Canada, right? Interesting. Uh, I, I want to change gears a little bit. We're talking about the feds and, you know, generally speaking, I think a lot of Western Canadians look at Justin Trudeau and think of his government as being anti-energy, anti-development, uh, blocking pipelines, banning uh, tanker ships off the West Coast, ma making it more and more and more difficult. Um, I know that there was that, I think it was Bill 69 um, that, that required, you know, gender analysis when it came to development projects. And it didn't seem like this government was ever going to approve an oil and gas project. But lo and behold, uh, we saw that, that, that the Trudeau government approved the Beta Nord uh, project out in Newfoundland and Labrador off the coast. It'll include some offshore drilling, uh, approximately 300 million barrels of oil. It's expected to create thousands of jobs for Canadian and generate approximately $3.5 billion in government revenue. Uh, so I, I, I want to hear your thoughts on this project. It seems like it's good news uh, that the Trudeau government is moving forth with this program. Um, but what do you say to, to people who still feel frustrated, uh, the, the feeling that projects are being strangled in Western Canada at the same time? Yeah, so a, a couple of things. First of all, uh, the government did uh, did ultimately approve and, and in fact even financed, you know, after they chased Kinder Morgan out of the country um, with their with their constant changes to the rules. Uh, they then stepped up and actually even approved and then, of course, got forced to finance it. And, and a lot of people say, well, I mean, every time I have people say, well, 
oh, look at this, the federal government uh, is actually even paying for your pipeline. Why are you guys complaining? When, like, you don't get it. None of us wanted that, right? No, mm -hmm. Nobody wanted the government to make the rules so bad that no private sector company could ever build a pipeline. And so that the government then had to pay for it out of our tax dollars. Like that's absolutely, like, it just infuriates me to hear people say that because nobody out here wanted the government to pay for it. We just wanted them to go, to be to be fair and have it approved. Um, so, the, but they did approve that process. I, I think one of the big, one of the worst things that the government did on the, basically the first week of being elected was cancel the gateway pipeline. This is, um, this is an unbelievably, you want to talk about Canada stepping up in the world and, you know, being that country that, you know, is, like I, I, my feeling right now is it's an opportunity for Canada to go up a weight class. We've, 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 we've been our entire existence, the junior partner to Britain or to United States or to United Nations and peacekeeping. We've been a junior partner punching above our weight. We've been so proud of that. Um, more recently, I just see us being a junior partner punching below our weight. Like we're just not, we're, we're floundering as a country, but we have this opportunity now, I think to go up a full weight class. Like we could be, we could be senior partners face-to-face uh, -face with America, Europe, Asia, saying we're the place that you can count on and we expect to be treated with that kind of respect. And by the way, you, it, it will pay for you to give us that kind of respect because we are the ones that will keep you going when there's a war, right? Um, so, but Gateway is the, the Port of Prince Rupert, a full day closer to Asia than Vancouver. Um, not not super busy, populated, beautiful city like Vancouver. I mean, this is a relatively underpopulated place uh, th th we, we should have our national defense there for the Arctic. It's the closest port to the Arctic. We, sh we should have a ma you know, massive port there for that. Uh, major ports there for bringing goods in from Asia, but also sending resources out, highways, power lines, everything. It's just a, it's a, it's a, it's a very um, visionary project. The Prince Rupert, Prince, Port of Prince Rupert is a, is, a, is a natural wonder for Canada, actually, if you spend some time looking at that kit of map. Prince Rupert area. But the other thing that was terrible about canceling that project is that there was close to 40 First Nations that had signed on to, something like 30 had signed, 40 in the middle of negotiations for benefits agreements. These are abjectly poor uh, people in the north of British Columbia and Alberta, and they had a chance to be lifted out of poverty. And instead, we condemn them to another generation of poverty. It's just, to me, it's, and, and by the way, it was done without so much as a phone call. Like you talk about First Nations should be consulted. Well, when you take away somebody's future, how do you not at least call them at a very minimal level of consultation? I mean, I've met so many chiefs up there who, who were just so just dejected and discouraged and, and, and felt absolutely powerless that their government wouldn't even call them to say, look, we're sorry. Nothing. It was just horrible. And, and, and there are First Nations kids not even born and we already know what their life's going to be like it's horrible i think this has been one of, to your point about a government that's been anti-resource they've been really anti-first nations too in, in in terms of ending on reserve poverty so uh i got a little bit off topic of your question the discrimination there i i do think that there has been a strong discrimination against resources generally we saw that with pierre trudeau too uh there's this idea um, and it's been popularized since Pierre Trudeau in the 1950s, 60s, that, um, you know, we really should stop hewing wood and drawing water as uh, to make our living, uh, like for our, for our America, you know, for our Ameri for Americans and other people. Um, and we should join the modern economy. In the, in the 60s, it was manufacturing. Um, what that led to was a branch plant economy. But at least branch plant economies come with real jobs, you know, union jobs, right? Uh, the current idea is that Canada is going to um, get away from primary production, hewing wood, drawing water, and we're going to become a high tech country. But, but I tell you, being a branch plant economy, when you know, to, to the Googles and Alphabets, and or I guess that's the same place, uh, Apples and and uh, Amazons of the world, like they, they, we won't even create the union jobs this time. We'll become a branch plant economy. So, uh, you know, somebody will create a tech company. Three people will get rich. A bunch of employees will work for a couple of years and then get fired, right? It, it, as soon as Amazon takes them out or whatever. So th this is this is a really dangerous industrial policy. It's a seductive idea. We're going to do technology, right? Oh, but doing that, by the way, we were going to do services. The end of the world, at the end of the day, though, if you look at it, what, what should a country do in a competitive world is we should do what we're best at. You know, we should let other people do what they're best at. I mean, 
Canada should not become try to become a world leader in precision machine parts. We should not try to become a, a world leader in mass manufacturing of T-shirts. We should not. I don't think we should try to become a world leader in um, in, in mass manufacturing at all. Right. The, the, the what we're the world's best at is primary resources. And what's wrong with drawing water and hewing wood if you're the world's best at it? What's wrong with that? There's nothing wrong with that. And and by the way, the technology involved to do that in today's world. It is one of the most, as I said, I started in tech. I work in oil and gas now. It is higher. It is, I deal with more technology. It's a higher tech industry than the high tech industry is, if you can believe that. Like when I was doing high tech startups, it was one, I was dealing with one technology or one, in, in oil and gas, I'm dealing with hundreds of technologies and they're all amazing. And by the way, you don't get to zero, you can't get to these zero emissions ideas without that new technology. Like this new carbon tech is going to be incredible. That rambled around a little bit, um, but I, 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 I think that the government has been anti-resource. I do think Ukraine is causing to rethink things. We are seeing some positive signs, but, but there's been some horrible mistakes made in the early part of their term. I think there's, some, there's really some serious glimmers of hope in their most recent pronouncements that they're getting it, that they're getting Canada should be the best. We should do what we're the best in the world at, if only because the rest of the world needs us to do it. Right. And, and if anything, I think that the, the lesson the world needs to learn from Germany and their failed green energy policies is that it's created a huge dependency on Russian gas. And, and, and that's part of the fueling of this conflict. And it's so obvious that you can draw a straight connection between, uh, you know, Putin's tanks and uh, Germany's gr green energy policies. So it's, it's really, uh, I guess, good that, that the Trudeau government is, is really that. I, I have a final question for you, Michael. You wrote an op-ed here at True North. Uh, where you, you talked about how Canada takes a very myopic approach to energy, and we sort of see it as two very black and white options, either business as usual, kind of neglect the environment and, and just do what we can to make money, or on the alternative, completely banning oil and gas, which just seems like that's the, the route that folks in, in government in Quebec and many environmentalists want to take. Uh, you, you instead suggest and, and discuss what you call the third option. I was wondering if you could just elaborate on, on what that looks like and, and how you can see Canada sort of balancing these two sort of traditional opposing uh, ideals. Yeah, well, I'm really hoping that, this, that, that one, you know, out of, out, of, out of a crisis, sometimes, you know, silver linings or good things emerge. I, I'm hoping that what it might emerge is what I think is a 21st century approach to energy and environment. And, and I think where we're locked into is a 1900s or 20th century idea. I think in the, the late 1900s, there was this idea that continuous growth uh, could not be sustained. And that, um, and so therefore we had to make a choice between business as usual, which we knew was going to make, uh, you know, like make, make the environment um, for some people think to a serious crisis that we wouldn't even be able to live in it, but, but definitely hurt the environment. Or our other option was to, was to go along the, well, let's ban oil and gas. And it's just going to mean you have to learn to live with less. And that, you know, like, like some of the weffers say, you know, you're, you're not going to own anything and you're going to be happy about it. So, but that, but that to me is a, it was a, was a 19, 1900, late 1900s, 20th century approach. And we've just locked ourselves into that business as usual or, uh, and, 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 and you, by the way, using the technology of the end of the 20th century, um, that probably was, that there's probably truth to that. It's just, it's the technology. And as I was describing earlier, the, the technology has, adva is, has advanced and is advancing very quickly. Here's another thing that people make, you know, get stuck into that sort of 20th century idea. They also sort of seem to have this idea that oil and gas technology is static and it's only wind and solar who, whose technology is advancing, but the, but it's the opposite. There's, there's enormous amounts more money being invested in research and development in oil and gas than there is in wind and solar. The industry is way bigger. Uh, the number, you know, number of patents, number of everything, it's all, a lot more. So that, that's a, another false idea that oil and gas technology is static. So we have this sort of thing like, let's compare what wind and solar will be with 2050 technology to what oil and gas was with 1999 technology. And, oh, I guess, isn't, it the, isn't the answer obvious? So, the, so what I guess I'm really saying on this third option is that application of new carbon tech, which is that what I went through, the idea of being able to reduce through efficiencies, uh, recycle, or return onto the ground our carbon emissions, that we can do that. You know, looking at the example of Europe, at least, at least you know, with what we know today, we can do that cheaper than trying to roll out 
uh, wind with today's technology and today's batteries. It would be cheaper for us to. So I'm calling that. Let's not talk. Let's not do a transition from one energy to another. Let's keep all of our energies, including wind and solar, but let's transform oil and gas into zero emissions energy or low emissions energy. And that and an energy transformation is a third option on climate, as opposed to the you know the, what I what I, I mean. The other thing I say, I like just say that the environmentalists of the last century, they thank you. You did a great job. You, you, you did the alarm bell. There's going to be 10 billion people. It's going to create environmental challenges. Thank you for waking us up to that. But you haven't had a new idea in 50 years besides ban and block. So retire and let a new generation of environmentalists who are solutions oriented, technology oriented, let them take over and let's solve the problem from the, with private market solutions. Oh, that sounds great. I, I, I like to hear uh, that, that there is a new generation of, of environmental thinkers that aren't as uh, doom and gloom as the one that get marched out in front of the media. People like uh, Greta Thunberg, who just basically, uh, you know, her, her, her job is to complain and to look angry and, and not really be productive in the conversation anyway. So it's good to hear that there are people out there making uh, reasonable cases and that the technology is really uh, speaking for itself. So Michael Binion, I appreciate your time. Thank you so much for joining us on the podcast. It's always uh, great to hear from you. Yeah, it was fun. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. I'm Kenneth Malcolm, and this is The Kenneth Malcolm Show.